Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the Future of Education. It's the 31st of January, 2013, and Stephen Bezushka is our guest tonight. Thanks, Stephen, so much for being here. My pleasure. The Future of Education is a Web 2.0 Labs project, thanks to Mighty Bell and Blackboard Collaborate. And look for the Hack Your Education Tour to start up again. That's actually how Stephen and I met through Craig Seashoals kind of a lateral connection, but one I've really been appreciative of. Coming up uh, this year, we have some great virtual conferences, starting with the School Leadership Summit uh, in March on the 28th, the homeschool, Worldwide Homeschool Conference in May, the Worldwide STEM Conference in July, uh, and we're about to announce a gaming and editing museum, Future of Museums Conference, as well as our regular library 2.013 this year and the Global Education Conference. All of that can be seen at web20labs.com. Also, if you're going to be at ISTE, don't miss ISTE Unplugged. That's at isteunplugged.com. All of the crowdsourced activities that exist around the conference, kind of our own fringe festival. Especially join us all day Saturday for the unconference called Hack Education this year. Coming up on the Future of Education on the 5th next week, uh, two shows that day. Richard Millington is going to talk about social community management um, for those of you who are interested in, in that sort of esoteric topic, but for increasingly the opportunity to run social communities online. Carol Black comes back to talk about a, an essay she wrote called Occupy Your Brain. I've blogged on this. It's very provocative, well worth looking at. Uh, and please do join us. She's a delightful guest. Laura Grace Weldon will talk about free range learning. Howard Rheingold on pedagogy. You can see the full list there. Lots of fun. And newly added to that list, April 9th, uh, Madeline Levine on her book, Teach Your Children Well. All of the shows are recorded in full Blackboard Collaborate form and in MP3. They're all up at futureofeducation.com. We talked about W. Edwards Deming and education two nights ago with Gary Obermeyer. That was really delightful. If you're interested at all in how the man who resurrected the Japanese economy under MacArthur, and that, there's actually a tie here, isn't there, Stephen? And we're getting a little bit of a lag on this connection, so sorry about that. But uh, Gary was delightful. Uh, and Deming is a fascinating person to study because as a statistician, <laughs> yes, there is. he really proclaimed the need for trust. So this is a chance for you to describe, to let us know, indicate where you're participating from. Look to the map on the left. You're looking for the star icon. Click on it twice and click on the map. While you're doing so, you can shout out in the chat and let us know where you're participating from. I'm seeing a number of connection issues from people in the room, so there's a slowdown. You're probably going to hear my voice chipmunking, and because of that, I'm going to actually change my internet connection just to make sure that it's not me, which means I'll be offline for about 30 seconds here as you tell each other where you're participating from. Okay, so hopefully that wasn't too bad and you've gotten to know each other. Stephen, are you still there? Oh, it looks like Stephen dropped off as well. And that may actually be the, the issue here is his own line, so I'm going to call him by telephone. I'll put up a picture here while we're waiting. If you are interested, these Mighty Bell spaces have been a lot of fun and very helpful. And here's the link to the Mighty Bell space for tonight's show. I've collected a lot of articles, videos there. This is a consulting project that I do for Gina Bianchini. She's created Mighty Bell and I love it. And go to that link. Okay, let me give Stephen a call here on the telephone. And Stephen's back. 
And Stephen, you've dropped off twice now, so I think I am going to call you by phone. And I'm going to do that right now. Stephen, are you there? Yes, I am. Okay. So you can still try and keep logging into the site if you want to watch the chat and the okay. like. But otherwise, you you know the slide you sent me, and I will. Uh, I'll you just tell me when, and I'll put them up on the screen. And I'm going to take a second here and increase the volume from your side. And I switched to a well, different. Uh, internet connection myself, and it might be faster, but go ahead with the phone. Okay. Well, we'll do the phone, and at least you can see what's going on in the chat. Okay, so um, tell us the core story here, uh, and, and I'll give I'll give my one sentence synopsis, and then you can correct me and move move forward. But basically, we have a fairly significant misunderstanding of the relationship between uh, inequity and health that's really stopping us from seeing what's actually taking place and why our health statistics are so glaringly bad or compared to other industrialized countries. Am I close? Yes, I think you've uh, given a, a very good synopsis. And the only thing I would add is I think our educational outcomes are about comparable to our health outcomes among countries and uh, for, I think, roughly the same reasons. So the core premise is that we think that individual behavior is the driver of health when, in fact, it appears that there, the inequities are, are actually more significant. Can you tell that story? So we think that our health is under our own personal control. And uh, the evidence is that only a small proportion of our health uh, can we actively do something about, uh, say, sitting here as adults. And part of the reason is that roughly half of our health as adults, and by health I mean chances of dying, uh, not just whether you're having a bad hair day, uh, our health is really programmed sometime in the first thousand days after conception, or maybe as long as uh, age three, four, five. Certainly before we go to school, much of the substrate of how long we're going to live, whether we're going to get breast cancer or prostate cancer, whether we're going to be hypertensive, have a heart attack, uh, is already uh, sort of written there in the epigenetic information. Similarly, our Capabilities of learning are determined in that early period, too, so that the efforts of remedial action, be it for improving uh, educational outcomes or for treating high blood pressure or stenting a coronary artery, their impact is limited. So, Stephen, I'm, are there two stories here? I mean, I've, I've listened to your audio, I've watched the video, it's a very compelling message. Just today, a big study out of the UK came out showing a significant decrease in uh, coronary cardiovascular disease for those who adopt a vegetarian lifestyle. Uh, how do you match the, the, the clear indicators, what appear to be clear indicators that our personal choice to say about food ha can have that kind of impact? with the message you just gave? So we take people in these studies who um, 
are already, say, a certain age, and then we give one group of people the intervention, the, uh, the vegetarian diet, and the other people eat whatever it is that they say they eat, and then they look at how well they do. And so, um, you know, there is some evidence that, you know, Dean Ornish's idea is that if you adopt these dietary changes, if you meditate, if you do yoga, you exercise, that you can change your, uh, your outcomes. But the bulk of, of that has already been determined beforehand. You know, we can all speak to people who did everything. They, um, they ate right, exercised, uh, saw their doctor, uh, and yet they died at a young age. And then there are some people who do all the wrong things, and, uh, and they show up with an obituary with, a, <laughs> a, you know, some long, long life. So, yes, these, these individual uh, behavior changes can have effects, but it, the effects are actually small. The proportional change is very small compared to whether or not you spent the first year of life in poverty, whether or not your mother uh, was a welfare mom when you were an insider, and it turns out the kinds of, of circumstances your grandparents faced. Now, in other words, health, health is transmitted intergenerationally. We can actually demonstrate that quite well. Uh, educational outcomes, too, though, you know, that, that's harder to, to assess in a rigorous way. So, absolutely true that, uh, you know, you're, you, you might as well do all the personal things you can to, uh, to improve your health, but as the Institute of Medicine's Shorter Lives, Poorer Health Report said, we die younger than people in all the other rich countries and for people who do all the right behavioral things and have, uh, you know, and are well off, economically well off, they're going to die sooner than their counterparts in the other rich countries. A very strong statement from the federal, from, from the think tank that advises the government on health. I'm not making this stuff up. No, this is so interesting to me. And we've spent some time on the show discussing the ways in which there is sort of institutional manipulation of popular opinion, especially around things like diet, that have, have a significant impact, a significant negative impact, because it's, it's much more profitable to treat the symptoms than to actually uh, help with the core causes. But your piece here is, is such an addition, or even, and I think you're going to argue it's, it's, a, it's an even bigger story. And this, the, the really sort of the tipping point for me was the cigarette smoking in Japan. Can you describe why that's such a, um, an eye-opening um, situation? OK, so um, you know, as, a, as an ER doc, you know, so I spent 30 years working in emergency departments managing all the things that uh, happen when people do all the wrong things to themselves. And so I used to rail against my smokers. I used to, I was nasty to them. I mean, you know, I tried to do everything I could to get them to quit. And then I discovered that people in Japan smoke far more than we do, and yet they live longer lives. I'm talking about Japanese men. Of course, I, you know, that's not the reason that they're so much, uh, they have so much better health, namely that they all smoke. But it does suggest that a behavior as odious as cigarette smoking may not be as bad for your health as I used to think. I mean, as a doctor, you look at personal behaviors and you think that they're the be all and end all. And once you begin to find that, when you look for evidence to, to, to support that point of view and you can't find it, that kind of shakes your, your, your fundamental beliefs. Same thing for diet, same thing for exercise. I do all, of course, I don't smoke. I, I, I try to eat mostly vegetarian. Uh, I exercise. I do all those things, but I'm not under the illusion that it is the major determinant of my health. The major determinant was laid down by the time I was two. I'm sure of that. So we tell a similar story in education, right, which is, this ability to lift yourself up by your bootstraps, that it's your individual initiative and effort. And uh, I've recently been doing this exercise at, at workshops where we do rock, paper, scissors, and then we get down to a small group of, of sort of winners. And then we 
talk about the degree to which you can feel like a winner because of something that was very chance oriented. Right? So where you were you don't have any choice in where you were born or the parents you were born to. We don't recognize often the degree to which your educational outcome is a result of factors that we ascribe the personal competence but but are actually much broader than that. Can you say the same thing about health? Oh, absolutely. You know, if you think of uh, and and let's let's just use um, let's just use an example um, to highlight that there's something fundamentally um, critical about the United States and our health outcomes. And and maybe if you could show that very first slide I sent you on Sri Lanka and the United States, and before you put it up there, let me just ask people in the chat room, uh, if you're a 15-year-old girl in the United States, what are your chances of living to age 60? What are your chances of, of not dying? What is your probability of dying in that critical you know, prime of life between ages 15 and 60? compared to a 15-year-old girl in a poor country, Sri Lanka. Well, you know, I, I, I don't know if anybody in the chat room would hazard a guess. Which girl, a 15-year-old, is going to have a better chance of being alive at age 60? The American girl or the Sri Lankan girl? Anybody want to weigh in in the chat room? Yeah, I see a, I see American there. Um, and I think almost all of us would think, of course, the American girl. So if you put the slide up, uh, if you can do that, what this shows you, the vertical axis is the probability of dying. If you're 15 before reaching age 60, the horizontal axis is uh, the probability, is the uh, trend from 1970 to 2010. So you can see that back in 1970, the Sri Lankan girl had about a 25% greater chance of dying in the interval between age 15 and 60. You, you see that 45Q15, that's a demographic term. And this graph uh, comes, you, you know, anybody who can draw this graph on their own by going to the data set for the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation. Um, I make my students do that, so they, you know, these are not my data. And and you can see that you know the chances of dying in the prime of life kept on decreasing for both countries, Sri Lanka in the orange and the United States in the red, but the curves crossed around 2001. And now the Sri Lankan girl, that 15-year-old, has a better chance of being alive than the American girl, about a 15, 10, 15% greater chance of being alive. Now, these are averages. And of course, averages can hide uh, great differences. But nevertheless, uh, this speaks to something really critical that has been happening in this country over the last 10, 20, 30 years. Namely, we're not seeing the improvements in, in this case, mortality outcomes that other countries are. And all the Institute of Medicine report that was featured in a half page on in the New York Times on January 10th, followed by an editorial on January 11th, it's looking just at rich countries. They didn't look at poorer countries. I just happened to pick a poor country here, and one that's endured a 30-year civil war, I might add. Uh, it's doing a better job of keeping its women alive in the prime of life than we are. This is a disgrace. So it, I would venture to say, go ahead. No, no. <laughs> you would venture to say? I would venture to say that the same things are happening in our educational outcomes. But you see, all this graph is showing is death. As an ER doc, it's the easiest diagnosis for me to make. Is somebody alive or dead? That's all you need to do this graph. Educational outcomes are much fuzzier. But you know we have uh, uh, the, the, the PISA scores for reading and math and science for 15-year-olds, and um, Sri Lanka, I don't believe, is in them. But we don't do much better for educational outcomes. Now, yes, you know our brightest are are, are some of the best in the world, 
Um, but I live in Seattle where Microsoft has to import all these smart people from India to work in, in, in Redmond uh, doing all this stuff just as, as Google does. We don't have the educated uh, workforce to serve our industries. And it's just like this graph. We've got a, we've got a pirate from other countries. So we talk a lot about the impact of poverty on education. What, what I want to do is I want to give you a chance to look at what, what you think the causes are of the shift in health outcomes um, and then make a comparison with the ways in which we might see those same causes having an impact on education. Does that make sense? So I think the two, yes, I think the two are quite related. Let's go back, say, to 1970, uh, the left part of the graph there. And, uh, and what was America like then? Well, um, if you take the median, the middle, two-parent, two-child family uh, with one, Elizabeth Warren, by the way, did this research. She's now the Massachusetts senator. Um, if you take the median two-parent, two-child family in 1970, one parent worked in the home, the other parent worked outside the home, and she compared them with the 2,000 median, that is middle, two-parent, two-child family, where both parents now worked outside the home, and their disposable income in 2000, with both parents working after paying for all the essential expenses, you know, rent, education, health care, food, all that stuff, they had more disposable income in 1970, was Warren's, uh, was, uh, uh, what Warren's study showed. So we have taken an, a, an incredibly rich country, and we have basically created a system where with both parents working, um, they don't have as much money as they used to have with one parent working. And what does it mean to have both parents working outside the home? They don't have that critical ingredient for parenting, which is time. We have no time to parent. We've outsourced parenting. And, and so in the first couple of years of life, what is the critical thing we need? You know, John Bowlby, studying orphans after the Second World War, said, you know, it, it, these orphans are securely attached. If they're faced, if they're put in front of a single caregiver, a single pair of eyes, for most of the first year of life, if they have several different people there, the kids behaviorally don't do as well. They don't do as well in school later on. We are we have created a country of insecurely attached children who can't learn. In the same way that it isn't present in Sri Lanka, for example, in Sri Lanka something like 85 to 90 percent of the women breastfeed uh, uh, as the only source of, of, of food for the first six months. It's close to 90 percent. In this country, you know, it's only a, 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 few, a few rich moms who, who, who do it. Our, our rates are well below 10 percent. And we know that breastfeeding is not only good for health, it's good for a lot of other things. That bonding, that uh, brain development. You know, Jack Shonkoff at Harvard says, if you're exposed to poverty in the first year of life, it's like you have a neurotoxin in your brain that there's no antidote for later in life. And this shows up in our educational uh, uh, testing outcomes, too. You also make a really interesting connection between the social, cultural, and emotional impacts of societal inequity. Meaning, in addition to the, these first, the critical first years of life, you also seem to be saying there's an actual outcome to significant inequity in a society. That's correct. Uh, think about it. You know, we in this country always make comparisons of ourselves with other people. And I'm sure that many of the people listening know uh, how much money um, movie stars make or uh, sports stars, you know, the Super Bowl is, uh, game is coming on, how much CEOs of various corporations make. We know these things. Sometimes we don't recognize the incredible differences. You know, I always like to uh, sort of present, what was the highest wage that anyone made in the United States in 2011? It turns out to be $541 a second. Now, 
I live in Washington where the minimum wage is one of the highest in the country, and so the minimum wage per second works out to be a third of a cent a second. So imagine somebody in a second in this country amasses more income than many of us do, than some people do in a month, even with all the, you know, in one second you get what poor people manage to call, call together in a month. So how does that make you feel? How does that make you feel that you're so far behind and you're racing to catch up? And you don't want to say that you're poor, because if you're poor, that means that you will never, you've disgraced yourself and you'll never strike it rich, because this is the country of the American dream. And something like 70% of the people feel that by the time they get, they die, they'll, have, uh, they'll become millionaires. The reality, of course, is quite different. So there's a stress in feeling behind. And there's stress physiology to back this up. Uh, there are, if, if you look at profiles of biomarkers, such as cortisol levels, such as hemoglobin A1C, such as blood pressure, such as cholesterols, these stratified by socioeconomic status. That is, poorer people are going to have more stress markers. They're going to have uh, uh, worse control of diabetes if they're diabetics. They're going to have worse control of, bl of blood pressure. Always in the ER, if I wanted to predict who was A, going to be sicker or who was not going to do well with my attempts at treating them, it was always the poor. Now, this starts in very early life, well before any behaviors uh, uh, can influence that. And let me just present an example. Um, a study done at Children's, Boston Children's Hospital some years ago found that if you had a pediatric heart transplant recipient, okay, so this is a little baby that gets a heart, babies of poor parents reject the heart more than babies of rich parents. They were shocked. They thought, how can this be a reflection of poverty so early in life when the kid hasn't had a chance to smoke or do any of those bad things? So they did a multi-centered study and it showed the same thing. Being poor is bad for your health. Being in a country like ours, which has the most child poverty of all rich countries, is bad for all of our health. And that's what the Institute of Medicine Shorter Lives, Poorer Health report said very clearly. I'm really interested in how, when we typically talk about equity as it relates to education, we, we're really usually talking about funding. Right, so we'll say, you know, Finland has a terrific education system. They had a commitment to equity, and that meant that they made sure that the same amount of money was spent on every student. You're saying something different, right? You're saying that inequity or inequality economically as a culture has a set of impacts that would help to describe why the United States that spends almost half of the money in, that's spent in the world on health care is at the bottom of these lists, right? And why, for spending a significantly large amount of money on education, also performs very poorly. Your message isn't that we need to be spending the same amount on each student. It's actually something deeper, right? Well, I think it goes both ways. If we spent the same amount on every student, if we had sort of parity in, in funding for education that at least reflected the uh, economic issues in the particular region of the country, that would be a first step. But I think that, uh, you know, right now everybody is saying we have so much inequality and people are, uh, you know, the, the International Monetary Fund says inequality retards economic growth. The World Bank is, is getting on the same bandwagon. Everybody is saying uh, inequality is bad for the economy. Studies in Europe, I mean, there are many studies linking inequality to worse health outcomes. It's just that it is impossible to get anyone in this country to take them seriously except the academic researchers. So, for example, there's a study out of Harvard published in 2009 that said, what if we had the economic equality of the healthiest countries, that is a Gini coefficient of 0.3 or less, Forget what a Gini coefficient is. It's a measure of income inequality. We would, they said if we had that based on a meta-analysis, that is merging all these studies on inequality in health, if we had that, we would have roughly 880,000 fewer deaths a year. 
That's one death in three in this country. So we can say uh, there is a strong, there's, consider, there's very good evidence to suggest that inequality is killing more people than say, tobacco, than uh, certainly homicides, motor vehicle act, uh, crashes, uh, all these things. And inequality is sort of the upstream phenomenon. It sort of seeds how the society functions. It seeds the culture. It seeds what we do. You know, I, I just saw in the paper today, um, I forget, somebody, oh yeah, uh, Time is laying off another 6,000 workers, Time magazine. Um, you know, there's always something in the business section about the layoffs. Now, what happened in Japan? You mentioned Japan before. You know, they've been having this economic crisis for 20 years. And uh, back in the 80s and 90s when it was just sort of revving up, Bosses and managers took pay cuts rather than laying off workers. That's the culture over there. We take care of one another. I, I'm really fascinated by um, by the studies on empathy. I, I was just reviewing a number of them yesterday. How much do we care for others? And uh, uh, Dasher, uh, Kellner Dasher at, at, at UC uh, Berkeley has been he has an interesting group looking at the spread of this by income. And the rich have very little empathy for others, and, and in strong contrast to the poor. Just think about it. If you've traveled overseas and you've been among poor people, uh, they'll share what they have with you. Do the rich share here? No way. It fundamentally creates the, the boundary conditions from a mathematical point of view or the circumstances in a society that patterns almost everything that we value. Our health, our social relationships, our educational outcomes, uh, the innovations in the economy. You know, Studies have shown that countries with a smaller income gap actually have more patents per capita than countries with a big income gap. Studies showing the income gap is related to educational outcomes. I mean, once you ask the question, besides, uh, you know, indicating how much money somebody has more than you do, what else does inequality influence? And you find, once you ask that question, it just has a huge impact all over the place. In one of the articles I read, you make a comparison with our kind of discovering the impacts of inequality to other sort of significant shifts or revolutions in how we've thought about scientific or cultural issues. Um, you know, sort of hunt, it, the kind of impact that that is seen over uh, you know in a century or a couple of centuries. Uh, do you feel that strongly that that looking at inequality is going to answer some things that we haven't understood? Oh, um, I mean, it has answered. It's not going to. It has. It's just that um, we have a system in this country that blinds us to it. You know, the Prime Minister in England uh, actually talked about uh, a couple of years ago with the publication of the Spirit Level. I, I think I have a graph of that. I have a, a slide of that. And I have a, uh, go to that if you can, the Spirit Level cover, book cover. Uh, oh, by the okay, we, we, yeah, okay. Yeah, go down to the Spirit Level. So this was a book published in, in the UK in, 19, in, in uh, 2009. And uh, it's been translated into 30 languages. And uh, in England, the, those, the Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett are two British researchers, uh, epidemiologists. And um, the prime minister in England actually mentioned it in the House of Commons. He said, you know, inequality is what's tearing this country apart in England. But we don't go there. You know, uh, so many other countries present this. Now, what they did in this book, The Spirit Level, Spirit Level, by the way, is an unfortunate title for Americans. It refers to a carpenter's level in England. But if you go to the next slide, what they did was create an index of, uh, for those who have some statistical knowledge, Z scores of life expectancy, math and literacy scores, infant mortality, and so on, all the things on the left there and plotted them against income inequality using, again, a uniform scale. And they took the numbers out of there so it was more, you know, so it was more uh, visually friendly. 
And you can see, I've highlighted the United States, we have the worst outcomes in most of those factors on the left-hand side. I've already said you know, our math and literacy scores are poor. We, we house a quarter of the world's prisoners. Believe that. One in nine African Americans aged 20 to 34, African American men, is in jail. But for the country as a whole, one in a hundred. Imagine that. What is it that makes us put away a quarter of the world's prisoners? It's linked to inequality and what inequality does to power relationships. Anyway, so the United States, for better or for worse, has the worst outcomes and the biggest income gap. Now, you can go to the Equality Trust website down there on the, on the bottom, and you can look up all this information. It's just phenomenal how much information is there on the web if you, if you ask the right question. And I think the teachers in our country need to develop critical thinking skills in students and use those uh, and, and foster that. They shouldn't, nobody out there listening to me right now should believe anything I said. They should discount everything I've said and if it's important, they should look for themselves and see if what I'm saying is true. So I'm interested in the degree to which both for health issues and education, Americans would probably uh, evaluate our system much higher than it actually ends up being. And do, do you see the same disparity in other countries? Has anybody looked at perceptions of r relative value or placement in these international studies versus the perception within the country? Because it feels like we're sort of uniquely ignorant of our own difficulties. Well, I, I, um, yes, for example, in the Scandinavian countries, um, they noticed that, yes, you know, some people have worse health than others. They, they call these health inequities. And, and, they're, and they feel that that's unfair, that some people in, living in Sweden or Norway or Finland, you mentioned them before, some people are better off than others in terms of living longer, and they think that shouldn't be. In this country, we have huge health inequities that way. Uh, you know, you take, I was speaking last November in West Virginia, and West Virginia, McDowell County in West Virginia has the worst mortality outcomes for blacks in the whole country. And not that far away uh, in, in Virginia uh, are some of the best health outcomes for blacks in this country. And, and it's a huge, huge gap. And I can just, you know, point out a whole bunch of others. We seem to be unaware of it because as long as we believe that your health is under your individual control, just as your poverty status, and that you know you, you just made bad decisions, you weren't, uh, you were too profligate. As long as we believe that, it doesn't matter if we have these uh, uh, different health outcomes or educational outcomes. The, you know, the, the value is, I got mine. You got to get yours. That is killing us on a grand scale. And again, I point to the Institute of Medicine's Shorter Lives Poorer Health Report to suggest there's something very toxic going on in this country that is killing all of us. They point out it's not going to be solved with health care. They point out that behaviors aren't the real critical issue, that there's something fundamentally wrong. Now, they talk about income inequality to a certain extent, um, and they review the studies there. Uh, they don't want to come down strong on that. Their recommendations are really fascinating. Their recommendations are, one, we've got to tell the people that they die younger than people in all the other rich countries. We've got to tell them. It's sort of like, uh, you know, 11 years ago, the government, every second sentence coming out of their mouth, the executive branch was a rack SWMDs. And of course, we all believe that, so much so that we, we had to invade the country to save it. Um, just because the government repeated that over and over again. And I think that's what we need at this point. The government, the, the Institute of Medicine report said, you know, we can't let the government do it. It's got to be uh, private organizations and nonpartisan organizations and charities and non-governmental organizations that have to inform the people. But um, I think only the government can do it. And if every second sentence coming out of their mouths today was, we die younger than people in all the other rich countries. Just like 11 years ago, we said Iraq has WMDs. 
after a year of that, people would begin to rattle their cages and say, hey, what's going on? Uh, it, it's going to take that kind of... So that's the first thing, tell the public. It's sort of like the Surgeon General's report in 1964 linking smoking and, and, and bad health. You know, the Surgeon General got on the soapbox and said, smoking is bad for you. Now, it took decades for, for action, but at least the government had the guts to stand up and say it. Second thing they said is, let's learn from what healthier countries are doing that might be applicable here. Can we learn from other countries that's so un-American because we mostly teach other countries? So what might we learn from other countries? Well, they mention a number of things, and let me highlight one very important one, and that is there are four countries in the world, only four countries in the world with a particular situation, and these four countries are Swaziland in Southern Africa, Liberia in Western Africa, Papua New Guinea, half of a big island north of Australia, and the United States. What do these four countries have in common and are the only countries in the world that do this? We have no paid maternity leave policies at the national level. We do not believe in parenting. We do not believe in giving parents the opportunity, the time to parent. And so we have, you know, even though studies show that if you give parents time to parent, school outcomes are better, Health is better, behaviors are better, but we don't do that. What does a healthier country do? Well, take Sweden. In Sweden, it is mandatory to take a full year of maternity leave at full pay. You can't get out of it. It's not awful. Now, if the father, if the mother takes the full tw uh, twelve months, the father's got to take uh, three months, three, uh, twelve weeks as well. So they see the importance of having both parents there. Then in Sweden, if you uh, the second year is not mandatory, it's optional at only 80% pay. Then in the third year, if you want to go back to work, you can put your child in the Swedish government-run daycare center. And what are the requirements to work in a Swedish government-run daycare center? You have to have an advanced degree in play. Because what's daycare all about? It's socializing the child. And you need experts. What are our requirements? Well, no recent uh, child sexual abuse history and the ability to work at minimum wage. We get what we pay for. So I see a note, do mandatory programs work? Well, they work in Sweden. Um, you know, we have this culture here that says, I don't want anybody telling me what to do. So that person can just lie on their deathbed and say, thank God I lived a shorter life. I surely wouldn't want to live a longer one. That's what we get in this country. And I'm, and I'm not excusing myself from this carnage. I mean, I'm you know, just like all the other people in this country, we don't have long, healthy lives. I wish it were other. I think there's a we distinction. Don't health, we don't have good educational outcomes. I think you can make a distinction between uh, honest assessment and building programs to actually strengthen a culture versus mandatory programs. I'm not sure a program has to be mandatory to necessarily recognize the issue, and that may be the subject of another night. But before we get to this, we're 10 minutes away from closing, and before we get there, I know there are some things in one of the articles that I read that were sort of suggestions of what teachers could do as activities that I really loved around this. And, and, and I want to get to those in the last few minutes. Before we do so, were there any slides you wanted to show that we didn't get to that you would feel like would be critical for this conversation? Well, let's go to the measure of a nation, uh, the, the book cover. I, I just want to review three um, graphs of, uh, from that book. This is a, a book that actually two weeks ago in the New York Times book review, uh, Jared Diamond said it was the best book he read last year. So. Coming from him, that's, a, that's quite a statement. Uh, I don't think it's received the, the attention that it deserves. But uh, he's trying to see how we're doing as a country compared to about a dozen or 15 other countries to just make the graph simple. And chapter three is all about education. And what it points out, you know, 
when, when I talk to people, that the answer to every one of our problems is more education, more education, more education. But if you go to the next slide, you'll see that we actually have more mean years of education than any of the other uh, rich countries. So go on to the next slide, and and you'll see that we have more mean years of schooling than all these other countries that, guess what, are health well, they're healthier, and they do better in the test scores. So more schooling is not going to be the answer. How much do we spend on education? An enormous amount. So go to the next slide. This is his graph of annual expenditure per student versus, this is the international uh, test that they administered to 15-year-olds, uh, to the PISA test. The average for math, reading, and science. We spend the most. That's, our, that's us on the lower right, and the horizontal axis is uh, expenditure per student, and those are our outcomes. For, uh, you know, Portugal, for spending half of what we do, gets the same outcomes. Japan, Canada spend uh, a lot less and do better. One critical thing is how we spend the money. That's just you know, averages, and again, averages. Uh, uh, mask all sorts of distributional issues. So if you go to the next slide, it's how much we pay teachers as a percentage of our economy for primary education. So that's ratio of teacher salaries to the size of the economy per capita. You know, we have the biggest economy in the world, and we pay teachers far less than the other countries there. So we spend about half of our educational budget on teacher salaries. So we don't attract good teachers. You know, we, we attract people that tend to fall into the bottom third of their uh, graduating uh, college classes. Other countries, teaching is, a, is an incredibly high status profession and is paid very well. Take Sweden, for example. I, I mentioned it for some other things. In Sweden, a surgeon and a high school teacher make about the same amount of money. They value both. Okay, so um, I don't remember which article it was in, but I loved these suggestions for teachers. Uh, right, one was to ask students to graph the top 25 or so countries in a health Olympics, the rankings of countries mm -hmm. by a mortality measure such as life expectancy. Engage students, then continue graphing beyond the 25 countries to discover where the U.S. stands. <laughs> that sounded like a great activity. It was. So that's that's one example. You know, get students to sort of draw their own graphs. What I do now is I send them to a variety of websites where, like the what you saw about Sri Lanka and um, and and the United States for the chances of dying in the prime of life. Um, so I send send students to these websites. I then send them to uh, counties in the United States where they've lived or have people from, and they can look at a variety of these. Um, Issues. I haven't done that for educational outcomes, just because uh, you know I'm mostly talking about health. Um, but something else I, I've done in high schools is do a uh, a reader's theater. That is, you enact a health Olympics uh, uh, event. If health were an Olympic event, we wouldn't be there for the final day's race. We would have been disqualified in the trials. So I've got this. Uh, you know, so I have a student reading the script. It's reader's theater. Uh, you know, a student with a, uh, a Japanese uh, flag T-shirt you know, comes across the finish line first. You know, really excited and happy. And then five years later, the United States uh, you know, crawls across the finish line because that's how far we are behind in, in life expectancy from Japan. So if you make it interesting like that, like I've had people you know come up to me in the street and say, you know, you came to our school and you did this health Olympics thing, and I thought that was great. I still remember it. You know, and we have to come up with creative ways of engaging students in the ideas and, and get them thinking critically about it. One other one that I liked so, was uh, putting up a map of the U.S. and indicating a life expectancy by states or areas and then trying to I figure out what the reasons would be behind those discrepancies. So um, again, you can go to the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation website, and you can see these uh, you can see these maps at the county level, and you will come across a sobering uh, finding there, namely life expectancy for women 
length of life for women is looking at the last 20 years is actually declining, going down absolutely. Women are living shorter lives in almost a third of U.S. counties over the last 20 years. That was not true in the previous 20 years. It harkens back, I think, to the difficulties that women face in this country. You know, I picked you know, the, the Sri Lanka American example. Uh, and it was highlighted in the Shorter Lives, Poorer Health report. Women are, are bringing down our health outcomes. You know, blame the women. I mean, seriously. Uh, we are creating conditions for women in this country that make it impossible to, to, to succeed. You know, Stephen, this is this is so, this is so far afield from what most of us have thought. Is there any willful deception here? Um, on the part of the media, on the part of the government, um, is it willful? Well, the Institute of Medicine's report came out. Uh, has anybody paid any attention to it? Does anybody know about it? I'm not sure it's willful. It's just incredible that things should be so bad in this country. And uh, so I, I'm just going to discount it. It can't be true. Now, you know, I can sit here and say this. Nobody's going to put me in a straitjacket and take me to a mental hospital. Maybe they should. But um, I'm only presenting things that are out there if you ask the right questions. This has been so interesting. I encourage people to, as I said, don't believe a word I've said. Find out for yourself. If it's really important to you. If what I've said about you know, uh, trying to do special ed or remedial stuff for children uh, in schools or, in my case, uh, you know, at the graduate student level or the undergraduate level, you know, I teach at the University of Washington. Um, you know, and I just think of our international students here. You know, I'm in the global health department. And I realize that the you know the really lucky kids who can come over here from Kenya or Nigeria uh, or China. What's common to all of them is that they had a really nurturing early life. Their first thousand days were remarkable. And, and we need to focus on creating those conditions in the first thousand days before we make any conscious choices if we're ever going to uh, get regain what we once had in this country. Stephen, thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, like I indicated before, there is a Mighty Bell space where, where I've collected articles, and I'm sure that Peggy George has gone in and about double that during the show. But there are all kinds of uh, okay. reports from Stephen and talks that he's given, and you're going to find a, an enormous amount of material there. Stephen, thanks again. That was terrific. Well, thank you. And, and put those links up, too, so because uh, you know, that gets people to look at these materials. Those links are all in that uh, Mighty Bell space. Yes, thank you. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. What a thought-provoking evening. Take care now and bye. Bye-bye.